Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part two of the Temple of God. In part one, we covered King David and King Solomon when he had put together all the materials for the temple, had it assembled, put it together, and he dedicated it. Now we're going to cover the part where he goes into apostasy, at least for a while, and uh, along with the people. And then uh, we should be able to cover the uh, fall of, well, the split of the two kingdoms. Israel and Judah after the death of Solomon when his son took over we'll cover briefly Israel's captivity into the Assyrian Empire and then we should be able to cover the briefly the Jerusalem's captivity in Babylon and then after that we should uh, go back where the temple is rebuilt under, well, that'll be in part three probably, where the temple was rebuilt under Ezra and Nehemiah after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And then um, after that, well, then we'll get to the New Testament where we get to the temple that Herod inherited, I guess you could say. And... Um, We'll see what happens. But that's probably going to be part three. So we'll see what we get along with. There's a... Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to cover Ezekiel's temple in the Millennial Kingdom or not. Um, I have a very, very basic understanding of it. I could probably do a study on it. Probably not a very good one, but I could at least cover the high points let me see what happens. Um, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do. But there is going to be a millennial kingdom, uh, a, a, a temple in the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And those that are in Christ that are resurrected in the first resurrection, that temple's not really for us. We're not going to be doing animal sacrifices. But... Uh, I believe that those that are in flesh and blood bodies in the millennial kingdom, I think that they will be required to do animal sacrifices. I believe that's how it is. I, I'm just throwing it out there. But those that are in Christ, no. Because the temple is our bodies. Um, if you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that the uh, Egypt, which is uh, Egypt, was of Ham. You had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem was the chosen seed line. Ham was not. But uh, the Egyptians was Egypt was called the land of Ham. And they're going to have to come up during the Feast of Tabernacles and honor the Lord. And perhaps they're going to be the ones doing sacrifices. I'm not completely sure. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. And if I'm wrong and somebody's got some scriptures to prove it, by all means. Um, like I say, I'm not the uh, I'm not the final authority on these kind of things. Uh, my big thing is is to help everybody not be fooled by the devil. you know, don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast, not to be fooled. Jesus said, be not deceived. That's the big thing. My big thing is to try to get you into the kingdom, help you help you get into the kingdom. I mean, I'm not going to bring you into the kingdom. That's Christ's job and the Holy Spirit. All I can do is warn you what Christ and Paul and the apostles warned about um, that could hinder us or prevent us from getting in taking the mark of the beast, 
worshiping the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist. Um, you know, the world is going to follow follow them. I mean, it's just the way it is. A lot of church people are going to follow them too. You know, you get one of these mega churches with 5,000 people. Honestly, I wonder if there'll be 50 of them that'll even, you know, not worship the beast and, and refuse the mark. I, I wonder if there's even going to be 50. There might only be five or 10. I don't know. You know, I don't make those decisions. So without further ado, let's go into the Bible study. Now, when King David and uh, Solomon, after him, when they first started off, uh, Solomon dedicated the temple. The Lord's Spirit filled the temple. And, uh, you know, everything was good. I mean, the people's hearts were... Uh, to receive the Lord, and they started off really, really well. Yes, King David makes some mistakes, and, um, you know, especially with Bathsheba and uh, Uriah the Hittite, of which I don't believe Uriah was a Hittite by blood. I believe, I believe he was a Hittite by geographical error area you know i mean people would call me a floridian i've lived in florida probably probably 50 years of my life but i wasn't born here so am i a floridian you know if i move to california does that make me a californian well, I would probably never move to California. Too weird for me. Well, upstate California is really nice. Uh, and the people are normal for the most part. My brother, my younger brother who died, by the way, um, killed himself with cigarettes and other things. He always said he wanted to live in weed, California. Yeah, there is there is a weed, California. But... That was probably one of the things that killed him. Sadly, I doubt very, very much that he's with the Lord. I doubt it. I don't make those decisions, but I'll be shocked. So, Oh, well. All right, so let's go. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 3. Now remember, Solomon started off really, really well. And then he um, started to... Well, let's read it. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now... Let me tell you something. Unless my memory is incorrect, the Bible never says anything nice about Egypt. Egypt is always a bad thing in Scripture. If I'm wrong, please show me. But I don't think anybody can. I really don't. I don't. I just don't think the the Bible always talks bad about Egypt. Egypt is just. Not a good thing. And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an ending of building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. So, here it is. He's making a friends with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he took his daughter. And let me tell you something. The, any king of any country is going to have a wife that's probably one of the most beautiful women you've ever seen in your life. Let's face it, ladies. Guys are very visual. And, you know, especially when you're young. Uh, 
hopefully when you get older you got enough brains to pick a woman that's got a good heart but uh, no most most of us don't but uh, I'll guarantee you Pharaoh had a beautiful wife and beautiful women tend to have beautiful children that's just the way it works so verse 2 only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. All right, so here's the start of, you know, starting the little fire that's going to burn out of control. Now, if you don't know the story, in 1 Kings chapter 4, uh, Solomon had a dream, and the Lord came to him and said, Hey, ask me what you want. You know, I'm going to give you something. What do you want? And um, he asked for wisdom. He didn't ask for the life of his enemies. He didn't ask for money, fame, glory. He asked for wisdom to be able to rule the people well. And, you know, the, the Lord honored that. And there's been a few rich people in the Bible. Job was wealthy. Abraham was wealthy. Because the Lord knew that Abraham and Job would never put their wealth ahead of the Lord. The Lord always came first. Uh, these charismatics, like on TBN, uh, it seems like they always put the money first. You know, oh, well, you know, you give me a thousand dollars and God will bless you ten times, a praise a, a Jesus. A, a, a. And then, uh, yeah, it's always give to get. That's, that's their little scam, I guess you could say. So in 1 Kings 4.29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. So, however, he would uh, women would be his downfall. All right, in uh, we're going to go to First Kings, chapter eleven, and we're guess we're going to read verse one. And, uh, all right, here we go. First Kings chapter 11, verse one. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Uh oh, here we go. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Oh boy, here's the bad news. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Oh yeah. And he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Um, Seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. Yeah. I don't know how you could uh, possibly uh, take care of that many women. Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't mean to be crude or anything, but uh, if you were uh, busy with, uh, let's say, two or three wives every day, it'd take you a year before you, if you had a rotation, to, before you got back to the, uh, the first one. So, I, ugh, 
Some guys think this would be a fantasy, but uh, personally, I think it would be a nightmare. I can't imagine having a a hundred different wives arguing and complaining and, you know. Oh, no, thank you. And I'll guarantee you every single one of them was gorgeous. Would Every single one of them could probably win a Miss, Miss Universe contest. And that's the thing. You better believe that the, the devil's kids, the Canaanites, when they sent these women to Solomon, they didn't do it because they wanted to help him and make friends with him. No, they did that to lead him away from the Lord. And Solomon, probably wanting to please his wives, probably, um, you know, probably worshiped their gods, which were devils. You know, uh, it's just how it is. You know, Satan has been watching us for a long, long time. I mean, Solomon was extremely wealthy. He couldn't, Satan could never tempt him with wealth. So he tempted him with the women. Verse 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went, af went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Who's Ashtaroth? Oh, she's got... A bunch of different names. Uh, I think the Greeks called her Diana. The um, Ishtar, she was called Ishtar. Today we call her Easter. Oh yeah. You thought Easter was a holiday or a day when Christ, uh, you know, the Easter egg hunts, right? No. Easter is a noun. It's a proper name. It's the name of the goddess of spring fertility. Her name is also Isis. Um, you know, she's got a lot of names. Uh, the Jews call her Lilith, among other things. So you got Ashtaroth, Isis, Ish, Ishtar, Easter, Diana. Uh, yeah. So Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. If I remember correctly, Milcom uh, was uh, either a, a, another name for uh, Moloch, which is where they would take your children and burn them alive, passing them through the fire to Moloch. I think Milcom and Moloch was just a different name for the same well, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil, did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build in high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. You see, he had all these gorgeous-looking wives, and he wanted to make them happy. So what did he do? He adopted their Satanism practices. Satan knew what he was doing. You know, he probably whispered in the king's ear and said, Hey, you got a gorgeous daughter there? Send, send her to Solomon. Let him marry her. And who knows, maybe these women were all possessed of devils. I don't know. One day we're going to find out all these things. And uh, I, can't, uh, I can't condemn Solomon because, you know what, I've done some of the same stupid stuff. Well, I never 
worshipped any of these gods, but I've done other stupid things which were just as bad. So, verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. No kidding, really. I never would have guessed that. Because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him not once, but twice. And he commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wow. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend, or tear, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it for, David's, for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son." Ah, there we go. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. Now, Edom is Esau, Jacob's twin brother, and in case you don't know it, uh, King Herod was, according to historian Josephus, a Jewish historian who lived during the days of Rome, during the time of Christ, he said that Herod, the Herod family, were Edomites. And in Genesis, uh, when Isaac blessed Jacob, thinking that he was Esau, um, Esau came in later and said, uh, bless me, O father. And Isaac said, well, I, I've already blessed. I thought I did bless you, but it must have been your brother, you know. And then, uh, but he said that, he said that in the latter days that Esau would break the yoke off his brother's neck. And uh, in the latter days, Esau would uh, be the ruler. And guess what? In the you know who ish encyclopedia, it even says that Esau Edom is in modern you know who re today. So Esau Edom is over in Jerusalem right now. A lot of them. I'm sure. I don't remember if that was the 1906 encyclopedia or the 1925 edition. You can't even find the 1925 edition anymore. They've removed it from the internet. I used to be able to, I, I wish, I wish I'd have made copies, but I didn't. So, boy, they are doing the censorship thing. They're big time doing that censorship thing. Oh, yeah. All right, so, verse 15. For it came to pass when David was in Edom, and Joab the captain of the host was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom. That Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. Now, even though they had killed all the males, he still had the women running around, the 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 bad bloodline. You know, you take an Israelite and have him marry a Edomite, Hittite, Canaanite female, and guess what? Your kids are polluted. And sadly, probably ninety-five to ninety-eight percent of the churches will tell me that, oh, that's a heresy. Oh, that's a heresy. That's horrible. Jesus can save anybody. Praise a Jesus. Jesus loves everybody. Well, read Malachi 1 if you think Jesus loves everybody. No, he doesn't. 
Esau, Edom is, God hated Esau, and he's going to destroy Esau, Edom. Destroy them. They're the Canaanite polluted bloodlines. So, and they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which gave him an house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife, the sister of his own wife, the sister of Taphnes, the queen. And the sister of Taphnes bare him Ginubath, his son, whom Taphnes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Ginubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. Boy, it's been a long time since I've read this. So, uh, here it is. He, Esau Edom is part of Egypt now. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers, that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to mine own country. Then Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, thou shouldest to go to thine own country? And he answered nothing. Howbeit, let me go in any wise. And God stirred him up another adversary, Rezon, the son of Ilida, which fled from his lord, Hadad Ezer, king of Zobah. And he gathered together uh, men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them of Zobab, Zobab. And they went to Damascus and dwelt there and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon beside the mischief that Hadad did. And he, abhor and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. So, I guess uh, Syria, I, from what I understand, Assyria was part of the Assyrian Empire. I don't think they were synonymous. It's sort of like, you know, maybe California and, and Texas and New York and Florida are part of the United States, but they're not just the United States. You know, so Syria was part of the Assyrian Empire, but I don't think it was the entire thing. But later on, they would become enemies of northern Israel. Uh, all right, let's go to verse 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and Ephrathite of Zerad, Zeradeda, Solomon's servant, whose mother name was Zerah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing the young men that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at that time that Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend, or tear, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give thee ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for thy servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me. Because they, not just the king, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, all, everybody, because they have forsaken me, and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways. To do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father, 
Howbeit, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I choose, because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. So you had um, uh, the tribe of Judah and then probably Levi too. And I heard Benjamin, part of Benjamin too. So that's what uh, Solomon's son was going to reign over. But I will take the kingdom out of the, his son's hand and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city in which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee and thou shalt reign according to all thy soul desireth and shalt be king over Israel. See, Israel and Judah were different. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, ain't going to happen, and will, will walk in my ways and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, that I will be with thee and build thee a sure house as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt unto, until the death of Solomon. And the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? Uh, that's not in the Bible. Uh, there's a few books that are mentioned uh, the books of the wars of the Lord. Um, you know, there's a few books so that are mentioned in the Bible, but they're not in the Bible. Verse 42, In the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years, and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. All right, now we're getting ready for the division of the kingdom. Now, you better believe that if the king is worshiping devils, demons, whatever you want to call them, uh, false gods, that the people are doing the same thing. You know, Solomon wasn't alone in this matter. Um, a pastor that I respect greatly, uh, who knows, who's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know, once said that um, the leaders are a spiritual reflection upon the spiritual state of the people. When you've got a godly people, you'll have a godly leader. When you've got an ungodly people, you'll have a Donald Trump or a Joe Biden or a Barack Obama and his, his husband, uh, Michael Obama. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Michelle or did I have it right the first time? Or Bush, or Clinton. You know, what can I tell you? But um, that's the way it is. So the people, it wasn't just Solomon. It was the people too. All right, so uh, I always get Rehoboam and Jeroboam mixed up. But Rehoboam is uh, Jerusalem and Judah, and then Re uh, Jeroboam was going to be northern Israel. The kingdom's getting ready to be divided. Israel and uh, Judah are getting ready to split. Now, remember something. Here it is. You got people on the Sabbath day going to the temple. And instead of worshiping God, it becomes a ritual. You know, oh, it's the Sabbath. I guess we ought to throw some, you know, go do the temple worship thing. 
And then on Sunday through Friday, they're worshiping the false other gods. You know, what does the Bible say that, um, uh, let's take a look. All right, I was thinking of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. I don't remember what movie it was. I don't watch movies. I think it was The Mummy or something like that. Uh, the Mummy found the some guy and he had a the six-pointed star around his neck and a cross and uh, all these different religious symbols, you know. And... Uh, you know, he's like, oh, okay, this guy's, you know, one of them, you know, or one of us or whatever. Uh, I don't remember the movie. I didn't watch it. I was just over at somebody's house when it was playing and happened to see that uh, thing. But, you know, <laughs> if you're going to wear the six-pointed star, a cross, the uh, symbol for Islam, the symbol for Buddhism, the symbol for, you know, this, that, and the other, Sikhism, Hinduism, Brahmaism, whatever, uh, and think, you know, well, you know, no matter who, which God it is, I'm, you know, I, I'm honoring him. That's not how it works. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You're either going to drink the cup of the Lord or you're going to drink the cup of devils. If you drink both, it ain't going to do you any good. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. And that's what was happening in Israel and Jerusalem and Judah. You know, one day they're worshiping the Lord very badly. And the next day they're worshiping the devils. And the Lord ain't going to have that. He's a jealous God. You know, uh, it's like, you know, guys, like you're married to your wife. Uh, she's really selfish. She doesn't want to share you with another woman, you know, kind of that kind of thing. You know, women are real selfish about that, you know. But uh, wish I'd have learned that when I was uh, real young but I didn't so all right let's go back to first Kings chapter 12 verse 1 now remember Lord is angry with uh, Israel and Judah because you know they're not faithful to him his bride is out whoring around with uh, the devils you know and remember the devils uh, Satan tried to kill God in the battle, the war in heaven. And if you want to be friends with the enemy of the Lord, um, let me know how that works out for you. You can write me a, a letter in, from hell. Um, of course, the paper might get burned up before it gets to me, but that's all right. I'll, I'll understand. All right, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. Now, Rehoboam is Solomon's son. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. And they sent and called him in uh Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Um, in other words, you know, when you got a thousand wives and, you know, the temple and all, you know, all these, the magnificent palace and everything, that costs a lot of money, you know. I mean, you know, you got a thousand wives, royalty, I mean, you know, pfft. That's expensive. So, the taxes are going to reflect that. So, 
Thy father made our yoke grievous. Yeah, they had a IRS back then in them days, right? Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. In other words, uh, hey, how about a tax cut, dude? We 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 really need it, you know. We need a tax cut. Give us a tax cut. We'll serve you. No problem. And he said unto them, so here it is, the king says, okay, uh, depart yet for three days, then come again to me, and the people departed. So, you know, give me three days to think about it. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon's father while he yet lived and said, how do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. You know? If you serve them, speak nice to them, they're going to be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which had... Uh, which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. Oh yeah, I'm going to talk to my young friends here. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that speak unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. You know, uh, the father's loins, you know, my little finger's going to be thicker than the the biggest part of my uh, father's body. In other words, I'm not going to lower your taxes. I'm going to raise your taxes. You think my father made your taxes heavy? Wait till I get through with you. Oh, yeah. And now, whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chast hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him. And spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your taxes. I mean, I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Whereas, I'm sorry, wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord. For the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? In other words, what inheritance do we have with King David and Ju Judah? And the answer is zero. Uh, what portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Ah, they killed the IRS agent. Oh yeah, you want to come here and collect taxes? Yeah, well, we'll show you what, how that works. So they stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore the king, Rehoboam, made speed to get him up from his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. 
Uh, so here it is. The king sent his IRS agents. They killed, they stoned the IRS agent. And then the king was scared, got in his chariot, and hightailed it back home. Oh, yeah. Verse 19. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, they, uh, that they sent and called unto him unto the congregation and made him king, and made him king over all Israel. All right, so now you got um, Jeroboam is king of northern Israel, and then Rehoboam is king of Judah, Jerusalem. So, uh, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin and hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came unto Shemelah, the, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the word of the Lord, and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and dwelt there, and went out from thence, and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. All right, so this, uh, this new king gets an idea. And Rehoboam, I'm sorry, and Jeroboam, king of Israel, right, said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even to, unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Ah, we can't have these people going down to Jerusalem and hearing the word of the Lord and doing sacrifice because then they're going to go, you know, they're going to go back to their king, the king of, uh, king of Judah. And they'll kill me, get rid of me. I can't have that, so I got another idea. Verse 28. Wherefore the king took counsel and made two calves, calves of gold. Wow. Uh, remember Moses, Aaron's, Aaron, Moses' brother, made the golden calf in uh, when they came out of Egypt? Oh, yeah. So he did twice as bad. He made two of them. And made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go, to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Oh boy. Don't go to Jerusalem and worship in the house of the Lord. No. Here you got, I got two calves of gold. Worship these gods, people. Yeah. And he set one up in Bethel, and he put the other, and the other put he in Dan. Now, remember, Dan was like one of the, uh, it, maybe the first tribe to go into total apostasy, virtually total apostasy. So he put one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And let me tell you something. You know what Bethel means? 
It means house of God. Putting the golden calf in Bethel was blasphemy. I mean, making the golden calf was blasphemy, but putting it in Bethel, that's like, that's like a double dose. Verse 30, and this thing became a sin. Really? I never, yeah. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. The lowest of the people. We're not talking about dwarves or midgets. We're talking about the lowest spiritual scum of the earth, I guess you could say. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests, the high places which he had made. So here it is. Satan worship again. Oh, yeah. Now, I could be wrong, but... Uh, it sounds to me that this is right around the time of Halloween. I don't know. The eighth month. Uh, let's see. So he, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. To the devils! Not good. All right, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Uh, so... Israel and Judah were both in apostasy, pretty much. Um, and the Lord is putting up with this for a while. But then there reaches a point where he says, I've had enough of this stuff. Time for a spanking. And that's where America is today. You know, people say, well, America's not in Bible prophecy. You know, there's actually people who think that uh, God is like uh, somebody who took the earth like a wind-up alarm clock. And if you're in ever wind-up alarm clocks, you're old. But uh, back before they had electric alarm clocks, you'd have a wind-up clock. You'd wind it up, and uh, it's like God wound it up, and then stuck it on the shelf and forgot all about it. He's just letting things go. No. 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 Nope. The Lord always follows the same way he does things in the past as how he does things in the future. Pretty much. Not completely, but... Uh... So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. And we're going to read about the spiritual state of Israel and Judah. And... Sadly for the churchgoers, most pastors will never explain this stuff to you, that there was two kingdoms. Israel went into captivity and they never returned to the land. They got scattered. And that's why they call them the ten lost tribes, because to the church world, they're lost. God didn't lose them. The church world lost them. But the church world thinks the Antichrists are uh, Israel. Figure that one out, if you can. All right, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Now, in the law, if a man married a wife and then divorced her, and she went and got married, remarried, 
uh, the law said that that woman couldn't go back to her first husband. But the Lord is saying, uh, you were my wife, but you ran off to be a whore with all these other gods, but I want you to return to me. Verse 2. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places. Yeah, they were trying to build that stairway to heaven, remember? Lift up thine eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. Uh, not a, not a, not a, predatory cat no not a lion tiger no no lying lion as in a uh, bed lying in the bed in the ways hast thou sat for them as the arabian in the wilderness and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness therefore the showers have been withholden you know the rain you gotta have rain to grow the crops right and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hadst a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Not only were they wicked, they, they weren't even ashamed of it. Verse 4. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king. Now, Josiah was a good king. He was probably the last good king that Judah had, possibly. I just know he was a good king. But the people, generally, their hearts were... Je uh, Josiah tried to do a revival, but things were so far gone among the people. They had done so much evil that the Lord, you know, the Lord's like, all right, well, you could have your little revival, but once this little revival wakes off, wears off, that's it. So, judgment time. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up, up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. See, they would go up into the mountains and under the trees and do their little Satanism and witchcraft. Because the witches love to go uh, do their things under the trees and in the groves. Um, they tend not to do these things in the city. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you know, they'll tell you, the witches will try to tell you that, oh, well, we don't do human sacrifice. We don't do that. Then why do they do it out in the middle of the woods, in the wilderness? Because they're taking children and sacrificing them unto Satan. Uh, they may not... When they first get into this, they may not know it. But once they've been heavily into it for a while, they find out that that's what they have to do. I mean, all these hundreds of thousands of children that disappear every year, what's happening to them? You know, that's why the Lord said uh, he had a solution for witchcraft. And the church refuses to even teach on it. Oh, that was a different dispensation. And that was for the Jews. That's not for us. We're New Testament Christians. Jesus loves everybody. Yeah. Yeah, God told you what to do with Satanists and witches. And Sodomites, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, uh, about three or four years ago, the Boy Scouts decided they were going to let Sodomites in to become Scoutmasters. Now they're in bankruptcy because they've had so many uh, lawsuits against them for sexual abuse. But that's just a coincidence, I'm sure. You know. 
and they and the churchgoers have no clue that judgment's coming to America. You know, people, I know I don't have any good news, hardly. The only good news is Jesus Christ. Uh, your day-to-day -day events, bad, bad, and worse. Terrible, horrible, and, and hideous. Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. The witches dare not do their wicked, evil deeds in a city because they're afraid that some people might have some righteous indignation and take care of them when they see them getting ready to sacrifice a child on an altar to Satan. Verse 7. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. The Lord asked Israel, come back to me. But she wouldn't do it. She didn't want the Lord. Turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So the Lord is asking Israel to come back. She wouldn't. And yet Judah, her treacherous sister, saw it. Verse 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. The next time some preacher tells you that Israel and Judah are the same people and tells you that the you-know-whos are God's chosen people, Show them this where God says he divorced Israel. <laughs> that throws a monkey wrench into the machine. Oh, yeah. I love doing that stuff. You know, my, short is, my sword is sharp. I don't have it all figured out, but I, got a, I know a couple things. I know a couple things here and there. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, spiritual that is, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. See, God divorced Israel, but not Judah. Why? For David's sake. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. Yeah. The temple worship had, becoming a, had become a ritual. The Lord, Judah was not following the Lord with her whole heart. You know, Half-hearted devotion is, you know, that's not good enough for the Lord. He doesn't want half. He wants it all. And I'm a fine one to talk, so. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. So as bad as Israel was, Judah was worse. Think about that. Verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. The north. Uh, Israel was north of Jerusalem, by the way. And say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful. Boy, that's the truth. For I am merciful, saith the Lord and will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding chil children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. 
And I will give you pastors, you know, like ministers, not, uh, not fields where the sheep eat the grass, no. And I will give you pastors, according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding, and it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At the time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Now that's in the future, people. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it. What nations? The nations of Israel, the twelve tribes. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah will, shall walk with the house of Israel, not the same. And they shall come together out of the land of the north. What land is north of Israel? Europe. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father and shalt not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications for the children of Israel, for they have perverted, perverted, perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills, and from the multitude of mountains, yeah, you're not going to find salvation in the mountains, on the hills, under the green trees, worshiping the devil. And from the multitude of mountains, truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers from our youth even unto this day and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. You don't want to know how bad things are? California, uh, I'm not sure if they actually passed the law, but the uh, either their House or their Senate passed a law saying that if a man, well, if, a, um, if somebody was a, uh, an adult, had sex with a minor, and they're within 10 years of age, it's uh, not going to be a felony anymore. Or maybe it's not even going to be a crime. I'm not sure. You'll have to look it up. So that means a 22-year-old guy can have sex with a 12-year-old boy or girl, and no problem, or maybe a little problem. I mean, Hollywood, or is it Pedo Wood? I don't know. But uh, this is the kind of garbage that, uh, yeah, this is the kind of garbage going on. Uh, next thing you know, they'll be marrying animals. Yeah. Well, that's already going on, but. All right, go to Jeremiah chapter 31. All right, so the Lord is not happy with Israel. He's not happy with Judah. He divorces Israel. Uh, they went into apostasy. Uh, it's bad. I mean, it's really bad. But the Lord still wants them to return unto him. But not half-heartedly, no. So let's go to Jeremiah 31. All right, we're going to read the whole chapter, and, uh, and then I guess I'll close this out. And then the next uh, lesson, I guess, I will uh, 
briefly cover the Assyrian captivity, briefly cover the Babylonian captivity, and then we'll come back to the second temple, which is going to be under Ezra and Nehemiah. And, um, and then we'll cover the temple in Jesus' day. So we'll cover that. Jeremiah 31, verse 1. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword, so the people that were left from, you know, the war, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. And that's going to be the future of the church, people, the wilderness. Read Revelation chapter 12. You know, the pre-tribbers say, oh, well, you know, the, the church isn't mentioned after Revelation chapter 4. I can't find the church anywhere. You know why you can't find the church? Because you ain't looking, buddy boy. And they think the Antichrist are going to be the church or the, the woman, the bride. You know, there is no Jewish bride and then a Gentile bride. There's only one bride of Christ. God is not a polygamist, okay? There's one bride, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. God has one bride. We are all one in Christ. The woman in the wilderness in Revelation chapter 12 is the future of the church. Uh, for as long as we can, we should have home churches, just like they did in the New Testament in the early days. In the book of Acts, they had church. They were the church. The people are the church. You don't go to church. You are the church. Where two or three are gathered together, Jesus said, there am I in the midst of them. They held their services in homes. That was the church, the people in the homes. That was the church. But there will come a time when the wilderness is going to be it. And if anybody's interested in uh, preparing themselves for a wilderness church, contact me. Shoot me an email. I got a lot of information on this stuff. I mean, you got to realize I've been studying this stuff for 30 years. Not just the Bible. I mean, I've, I've, and I was in the army. Do you know how to start a fire uh, when it's zero degrees out there? And I mean zero Fahrenheit or minus, I don't know, minus 20 centigrade and the ground's wet and it's freezing cold do you know how to start a fire and you have no matches i do i do the two most important things you could ever have out in the wilderness is a good knife and a fire starter yeah that is probably the, the most two important things that you could ever have. Because if you're freezing, you, you know, start a fire, you can warm yourself up. And I've done it. Um, you can boil water, purify it. You can cook food, kill the parasites. And if you got a knife, you can prepare that food. If you got a knife, you can prepare a uh, shelter. You know, very important. And you can get those two items for $100. A good knife. A good knife. I recommend uh, I recommend a K-Bar. Uh, those of you that were in the Marines, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, K-Bar, they've been around since World War II. They made knives for the Marines in uh, the Pacific War Campaign in World War II, fighting Japan. 
because uh, it was that was a totally different environment than a, the guys that were fighting in Europe. They didn't get knives; they had bayonets. But uh, when they were fighting on the Pacific Islands, uh, they had to. It was a totally different environment. They were in the jungle, and you know. But enough of that. We're uh, the Wilderness Church is coming, and if the Lord wills. I'll be part of it, and if not, well, I'll uh, I'll probably lose my head. Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, The people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Wow. Think about that. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. We get a New Testament witness to that in John 6, 44. Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see, if God the Father doesn't draw you to Christ, you ain't going to be there. All right, Jeremiah 31, verse 4. Again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Wow, the whore just became a virgin. O virgin of Israel, thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Merry as in happy, not, you know, not Mary and Betty and Susie and, no, not that Mary. Verse 5, Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. Samaria was the capital of Israel. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. The planters shall plant and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to, Mount, uh, up to Zion unto the Lord our God. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chiefs, uh, the chief of the nations, Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. And that's what it's going to be, people, a remnant. Verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. Now remember, Israel was scattered. Israel was to be scattered. I mean, well, we haven't gotten there yet. We will. But the Assyrians uh, scattered them. Right? Well, when the, the empire collapsed. What, what country is north of Israel and Jerusalem? Europe. Who printed the Bibles? Well, the first country to, to print Bibles was Germany. Perhaps you've heard of Gutenberg, the printing press. It was the first book they printed, Germany. What countries built all the churches? Europe. What country is north of Israel? Europe. Well, Europeans, you know. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they will not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Huh. I thought Reuben was. Eh, there's probably something to that, but I, I, I'm not going to go there. I thought Reuben was the firstborn. Let me check this real quick. Okay, Reuben was the firstborn, but he slept with um, 
one of the mothers of the other children of Israel. Uh, and Joseph was the uh, was Rachel's firstborn, the loved, the beloved wife of Jacob Israel. And Ephraim and Manasseh were his two kids. So, huh? I guess it, he considers them his spiritual firstborn, because Reuben. Uh, slept with uh, one of Jacob Israel's handmaids or concubines. I mean, she bore him some children. So he, I don't know, Jacob should have uh, got him a wife, you know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't know if he forced her or if she was willing, I, you know, those kind of things. I don't know. Bible doesn't give you a lot of information there, but uh, evidently this considered um, Ephraim, I guess, was the spiritual firstborn. I don't know. Jeremiah 31, verse 9. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. What isles? Well, Greek, Greece is a bunch of islands. And guess what? The New Testament was written in Greek. And where did Paul go? Greece, a lot. Ephesus was a Greek. Ephesians. Corinthians. Corinth. Greece. Um, Thessalonians. Thessalonica. Greece. What other islands? Uh, had the gospel. How about England? You ever heard of the King James Bible? Guess where that was printed? Guess where that was put together? England. And declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. And who was that? The devil. Verse 12. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil. Ah, for wheat. Didn't Jesus say he was the bread of life? And for wine. What did Jesus say? Take this cup. Uh, the blood. Uh, this is the blood of my New Testament. And for the oil, what was the oil? The New Test, I mean the uh, Holy Spirit, right? In the Holy, in the New Testament, for the wheat, and for the wine, and for the oil, and for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. In the book of Revelation, doesn't it say that it'll wipe away all tears? Verse thirteen. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. And I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Guess what, people? Guess when this happened? Remember when Herod killed all the children in Bethlehem? I think it was, what, two years old and under, or was it three years old and under? He killed a lot of children. Weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. I believe all these children are going to be resurrected one day and be given a chance to grow up and be tested uh, and tried and tested. Verse 17. 
And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me. Oh yeah, you got spanked, big buddy. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock, unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I will be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed. I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Boy, I can relate to that. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Set up, uh, set thee up waymarks. Make thee high heaps. Set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to these thy cities. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. I believe that this is a reference to the virgin birth. I could be wrong, but... Verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, As yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof, when I shall bring again their captivity... The Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. And there shall dwell in Judah itself and in all the cities thereof together, husbandmen and they that go forth with flocks. For I have satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Upon this I awakened and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. Huh. The seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down, and to throw down, and to destroy, and to afflict, afflict. So will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. In those days they shall say no more, The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity, Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Listen to this carefully. I'm going to read it twice, maybe three times. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant, not a renewed covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Uh, Hebrew roots people will say, oh, that word new covenant, that's mistranslated. No, no, it's a renewed covenant. You know, we're, he, God's going to re- renew that covenant. Yeah, it didn't work the first time, so we're going to try it again. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. You know, you got a car that's got a dead battery and you try to start it once and it didn't work. Well, what are you going to do? Try to start it again? It doesn't crank. Okay? It needs a new battery. Or a charged battery. A dead, all right, it's a dead battery. You need a new battery. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new N-E-W covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand 
to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. See, God didn't break the covenant, the people did. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. See, it's a new covenant, not a renewed covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. Do the Hebrew roots people have the uh, law in their inward parts? And write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That'll be the day, huh? Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances, ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So until the uh, sun and the moon and the stars vanish, the seed of Israel, uh, until that happens, the seed of Israel uh, will you know, end up ceasing from being a nation from him forever. Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner. And the measuring line shall yet go forth over against it unto the hill Gerub and shall compass about to Goath. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields unto the brook of Kidron unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever. All right, let's go to the book of uh, Hebrews and we're going to read chapter 8. You know, um, the number 8 signifies a new beginning. I know I've mentioned it in the past, but um, for new listeners, whatever. Uh, on the eighth day, a child, a male child, was circumcised. And uh, there's nothing in the Bible about circumcising uh, little girls. That's a Muslim thing. Not in the Bible. There's no such thing as female circumcision in the Bible. Uh, that's where, that's a Muslim thing. And I'm I, I if I would I wouldn't well I wouldn't allow I wouldn't allow them in the country to begin with but uh, but I would I that would be totally outlawed totally outlawed if I were in charge but I'm not in charge so all right Hebrews chapter eight uh, that's why I was saying the um, I see a lot of uh, when they divided, uh, I think it was the Geneva Bible that first divided the Bible into chapters and verses. And I believe totally with all my heart that whoever did it was led of the Holy Ghost. I, I just, I, I see all these numbers pop up. Uh, for example, chapters 13, chapters 11. Uh, 11 and 13 are usually bad news. Um, and then there's like certain numbers that pop up for good things 10, 12, 40, 24 uh, those numbers end up being good things if I remember correctly the Old Testament had 39 books and then the 40th, uh, 40th book was Matthew the Gospels, Jesus Christ So 40 was a, a pretty good thing. So 8, a new beginning. 
Hebrews chapter 8. And then we're going to close this out. Verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, a high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now it's talking about Christ here. Christ is a prophet. Christ is a priest. Christ is a king. The merging of the tribe of Levi with the merging of Judah. Joseph was of Judah. Mary was of Levi. Well, at least her sister was. Elizabeth, or cousin, cousin, was a Levite. I believe Mary was a Levite, too. So Mary, a Levite, carried in her womb the tabernacle of God. Think about that. We have such an high priest. So here it is. got the merging of the priest's office with the king's office. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Now, how can a renewed covenant, how can redoing the same old thing be a better covenant? It's not. Hebrew roots people are, I, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. You know, Judaism didn't work the first time and they want to go back to it. When you think about it, and they won't even use the name Jesus. I mean, Gabriel gave Jesus his, uh, his name on the behalf of the God the Father. You know, Gabriel didn't do it by himself. The New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. Contrary to what they try to lie to you and tell you. There are no Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament. And when you know who tried to kill Christians and who killed Jesus and who tried to stamp out Christianity, it wasn't the Romans. Well, at least not at first. Not in the original not in the old day. Not in the not in the days of the apostles in Christ. So Verse six But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. You know, if, the, if it worked the first time, they wouldn't have needed the second one, people. Verse 8, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Isn't this what we just read in Jeremiah 31, 31? Oh, yeah. Almost word for word. 
And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquity will I remember no more. In that he saith a new com uh, covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Well, people, this is the end of part two, Temple of God. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.